Welcome to Bat Lessons, the Batman History Podcast. I'm Brian. And I'm Alex. And on this episode, we head back through the looking glass for another set of Wonderland-inspired characters, Tweedledee and Tweedledum. That's right. Uh, we had some positive reception to our last episode on the Mad Hatter with Sasha from Casually Comics. But we did have one person chime in in the comments. Did you see that, Brian? Uh, I did see that. Do you want to read it? Sure. Uh, uh, Nicolo Proy, yeah, <laughs> three, six, seven, eight. Nicolio, Nic, Nic, Nicolo Proya, Nicolo Proya. I I like mine better. Okay, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I mean yours. We were way smoother. But what this person said was, uh, <laughs> the thing is, this is not even the first appearance of a Mad Hatter villain in Batman in Detective Comics seventy four. There is the first appearance of Batman's villains Tweedledee and Tweedledum, and one of their henchmen is a guy from with a Mad Hatter costume. Yeah, and it, it turns out, you know, he's right. We, I had actually planned for us to do Tweedledee and Tweedledum at some point. You know, I thought we'd loop back for it eventually, but, you know, we got some feedback about it, and I said, thought, let's do it now. I also uh, had kind of one of those signature Alex <laughs> uh, way too much history deep dives on <laughs> Alice in Wonderland. So I have some leftover notes if you want to learn more about some of the history behind all of that uh, and and thought it could be fun. Yeah, let's do it, man. Do you do you know anything about these characters or Alice in Wonderland? I've seen the Alice in Wonderland Disney classic, mm-hmm, uh, animated mm-hmm. animated classic, but that's a that good is about the end of it. Frame of reference. You didn't see the Tim Burton Alice in Wonderland that happened a couple oh, years ago? Yeah, I did. I did. Yeah, the special effects in that one are pretty painful. I went back and to, to watch it. Uh, I don't know a month or so ago, and it's like, oh, it's very like you know two thousand six or whatever. Right. I remember very little uh, from that movie. <laughs> I, I, you know, the first like 20 minutes of that movie are wonderful. I really, really love everything up into when she goes uh, into the rabbit hole and the way they reimagine some of it. But after that, it's just like the it, there's not a single shot that's just like entirely digital. And it's pretty mm. rough because uh, that's of that era, which is which is so painful because like Tim Burton is normally like the movies are so gorgeous. Like it's all yeah. his art. It's all his, you know, whatever. And um, to have it so, th- sort of through like a gray smeary lens of like, you know, mid mid 2000s digital. Uh, is painful but yeah let's jump into the story i guess let's do it so it's detective comics number 74 we're actually going back a couple years in time from mad hatter so this was first this is the first issue we're reading on the show that's written by an author named don cameron i'm sure we'll talk about him more in the future he did some notable issues including this one he also did the first appearance of alfred nice um he he wrote for the newspaper strip which there's an episode coming up on that really soon yeah we'll, we'll, we'll talk about him more oh yeah he created the bat boat and some oh, other uh, well-known characters. There's a character called the Cavalier who's uh, famous in Batman and Toy Man for Superman as well. So, And art here is Jerry Robinson and George Rousseau. Is 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 this the first issue where we have the Batmobile? Um, I, it might be the first one we've covered with the Batmobile, right. but it's definitely not the first appearance where they yeah, call that, it the Batmobile. Right. That's what I meant. The first we've done. I think so. Yeah. Lately, we've uh, transitioned to covering only title pages because... One of the themes of like covers of Detective Comics and Batman, you know, during this era is that often the, they don't have anything to do with the book. Yes. But this is one where the cover does have to does go with it. And I think it's pretty, pretty neat. Yeah, this one's kind of funny because it's kind of got Batman getting tripped up. Twe- yeah. Tweedle, one of the Tweedledee or Tweedledum, one of them is mm-hmm. rolling sideways. Uh, they make, I don't know, a bunch of jokes about how large these these yes. dudes are in over the comic. Over and over again. Over and over, yeah. And so, obviously, one of them is rolling down the hill sideways, kind of like a log or something, and it's tripped mm-hmm. up Batman, and uh, Robin's about to get crushed. Um, <laughs> and, yeah, I mean, it's pretty much the, the long and the short of it. We've got the, the two dudes. They look exactly the same. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Tweedled. Yeah, there it is. And then we've got the title page, which is another really fascinating one. We've talked a lot about Bill Finger and his gimmick book, right? And that people associate the sort of like ridiculous or crazy set pieces with him where there's a giant record player or a giant typewriter or, you know, they think of like the Batcave with the huge mm-hmm. T-Rex and the penny mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and these sort of like larger than life or like weird scale things happening. And they associate it with Bill Finger. But here we have on the title page of the story, a similar sort of setup where they're on what looks like maybe a desk. Yeah. Um, Batman and Robin, they're next to like a pen and paper and an inkwell. 
Got a um, big books. old telephone. Mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm. books, a uh, vase of roses. Like it's, it is definitely a desktop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they're like, what, four inches tall? <laughs> oh, yeah, the they're a- action figure size, like G.I. Joe, the the four inch. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like definitely of the era uh, and of the trope, but written by someone else uh, mm-hmm. and drawn by by Jerry Robinson. So um Interesting that like some of this is in the water. It's not just coming from from Bill Finger. It does kind of tie in with Alice in Wonderland because that's one of the first things that happens to her, right? Is she shrinks down very she small. The mushroom, yeah. The mushrooms later. Oh, I think it it's Drink cake? Me's first. Drink Me's okay. first, and then the cake makes her bigger. Okay. Uh, sorry, I read the book. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll talk more about it later. But like, yeah, she's eating cool. and drinking things throughout the whole story to like grow and get smaller and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, is there anything else you want to say about this page? I was going to ask, uh, do you know what... So there's a picture of Tweedledee and Tweedledum. Is yeah. it supposed to be just a picture or is there something significant to that apparatus that they That on? reads to me like maybe a mirror. Maybe one of our listeners can tell us. It's on like a little kickstand. It looks like it's reflective, like it's glass. Maybe... Yeah. You know, if you told me it was like... Um, you know, one of those fancy services for displaying like a, what's it, a fractal where they print stuff on glass <laughs> or like display it or something like that. I'd be like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like it's uh, um, kind of G- reflective and they're on there. Given that it's the 40s, I would be curious if it was some o- old style of like desk picture mm-hmm, stand mm-hmm. or something. And, and that is just like behind glass or something. Uh, but I, I don't I don't know if there's any significance to it. I was just kind of curious because I'm I don't think I've seen anything like that. I don't think I have either, yeah. Anyway. So, yeah. Let's move along. <laughs> yeah, the story begins. It's night in the warehouse district, mm-hmm. and we see the Batmobile driving uh, driving through the, the streets. We cut to Sable and Company, or Carmine Sable and Company. We can't really see. Um, it's a fur business where they're trading furs, or, you know, a warehouse, I guess. It's kind of weird to think that it there's is a, a warehouse, warehouse full of furs. And we have these two goons that are kind of in, uh, you know, like, newsboy get-ups, I guess. It's hard to describe, like a like a paisley suit. And, you know, newsboy cap. Yeah. And they roll up in a box truck and they hold up the worker who's there. He's like, we're closed. And they're like, no, you're not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they, they shoot Pull him. The gun. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of weird. I did notice here because in the next panel, it says like, and they moved in silently, but they just like uh-huh. blasted a gun. So it's <laughs> yeah. like not that silent. But yeah, they, they go and they start feeling, te- uh, man, stealing furs. And yep. we've got huge, huge dude d- dressed up nicely. Um, I, I wanted to comment the art on this is like notably better than some of the stuff we've, se- we've seen in the past, Mm-mm-mm. in my opinion. Um, but the dude's just like awesome money, power. I want it all. Yeah, it's really interesting. He's he's kind of like um, he's got a layer, right? He's sitting in like what looks like a an armchair and he's got like side tables and books and like something hanging on the wall in the back of the box truck. Yes. Like you definitely get the vibe that like he hangs out in here. Like this is yeah. a place he he passes the time. He's not doing any work. He's just sitting in his chair and and like he's telling his goons, "Load up the furs, guys." And they're bringing him to the box truck. Yeah. Kind of a an odd visual. Um it's interesting you bring up the gunshot because that's how ba- Batman and Robin get clued in. They hear the gunshot from from, you know, where they're on their beat, you know, during their patrol. Mm-hmm. And they decide that they're going to take a look and they climb a nearby water tower and they're quipping to each other and they they swing in from above and they do some fighting with the goons and and then uh they they get to the back of this box truck and they see this this guy that that we as the reader we know it's either Tweedledee or Tweedledum yeah they don't know who it is it's just this huge huge dude sitting in a chair and he calls out to him it's funny because Batman and Robin are like, yeah, we're going to get you. And Batman even says, like, Robin, be careful. There might be a trap. And immediately (laughs) get caught in a trap. Foreshadowing is a narrative device. (laughs) And, and yeah, they're in big trouble. They... They're, they're like bear traps or something. Uh, we find out later they're like wolf traps. <laughs> yeah, they make a really big deal of saying they're not bear traps because if they were, they would have to like amputate their legs. No, these are wolf traps. That's right. Much <laughs> smaller. And uh, and one of the... Th- and so, yeah, they they drag them out. They're in trouble. And one of the thugs is like, why don't we just shoot these guys? And the boss man is like, no, I, I really want them to taste defeat and then uh, maybe they will think twice about meddling in other people's business, and then they leave. And like he could have ended all of their problems if they just like killed Batman and Robin right then. 
sure, and sure, sure, sure. it was like no we won't <laughs> it's just it's kind of one of the tropes right the goons the the gangsters have to like build their reputation they have to like you know if 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 they're dead then they you know don't get to put the word out that they're not ones to be crossed or whatever oh i just thought this doesn't make any sense to me i all you'd have to do is say like yeah we killed batman and robin <laughs> Well, amazing is, reputation immediately it's it's true but like we, it's it's as the reader right we have to have an excuse to get them in peril to feel like maybe they they have a, a shot at being bested or whatever oh, sure. can't we're on page three they can't end the story yet yeah and they don't just leave they have this um sort of like three stooges like comical so so they're in these wolf traps right and they're sitting on the the sort of like lift gate on the back of the box truck. So if mm-hmm. you imagine, like, you've ever had a U-Haul and there's that little, like, you know, ramp, right? The ramp is going into the warehouse. They're sitting on that. And <laughs> what they do is they drive the box truck away and they're yoinked off the back of the box truck, the open box truck, by the wolf traps. <laughs> and they kind of fall off the edge onto the ground. I guess Batman's really strong, so they take him off and they go back to the Batmobile and they immediately hear on the police scanner that there's, um, you know, a sketchy looking dude, fat guy with two goons at a jewelry shop across town. And Robin's like, hey, that sounds like the same person. And Batman's like, let's go check it out. But Robin is also like, how could it possibly be the same person? Because in that truck, it would take him like 15 minutes. Yeah, there's no way they've made it. There's no way. Across town. Mm hmm. So we cut to that scene, right? So this is another, like Brian was saying, they repeatedly make a big deal about the fact that like these guys, the fat guys, they they don't stand up. They don't walk. They don't like, they're always just sitting, right? So in the, in the, the first guy, he's in the box truck. He's sitting in the back on his throne. We cut to this limousine and he's asked the jewelry store to bring stuff out to him. <laughs> So he's sitting in the back of the limo. There's um, a dude who's like very fancy. He's bringing a tuxedo. He's got the monocle and he's got like a tray with diamonds on it. And he brings it out to the dude in the the back of the limo to show it to him. Yeah. And he does make a comment about how unorthodox that is. Yeah. Right. But they're like, hey, if he's got a lot of money, I want to make a sale. Yeah. 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 They called him prosperous, which I thought was a a, a interesting euphemism for overweight, I guess. Yeah. And, um, as he shows up at the back of the limo, the two goons pull guns and the the fat guy takes what like his cane and like he whacks the diamonds. I don't know if he's whacking a gun out of someone's he's hand. He's whacking the gun out of the security guard's hands. Oh, I understand. Okay. There's a security guard with him. He whacks the gun out of the, those hands. And Batman and Robin are across the street. They witness this. Mm-hmm. So yet again, they they don't just fight from below, right? They have to swing in from above. Before it was a water tower. Now it's a electric pole. <laughs> so they climb up the electricity pole so they can swoop in from above. They fight the goons. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a second where Batman looks like maybe he's in trouble because he's he's got a gun trade on him, and that's when Robin swoops in. And uh, Tweedledee or Tweedledum, they don't say which one, right? Uses his, his that that same cane that he he just knocked the the guy's gun out of his hand with, and he. Mm-hmm electrifies them somehow like it shocks yeah it's them. like a cattle prod kind of thing just just shocks the heck out of them knocks them out yeah they're passed out they wake up and it's the police are around them and they're like what happened and they're like yeah you must have been shocked and you're like well shoot and then flash to wayne manor and they're bruce and uh dick at this point bruce is like how how could this how could this be and they're they're both kind of confused about how they move so fast yeah, it's and, like the same guy. He got away from mm-hmm. us twice in a row. How do you get across town? Yeah, they they followed us twice in like 30 minutes. And then yeah. I, I think Alfred makes a comment that's like, it doesn't have to be the same person or something like that. They go to the Fat Man's Emporium. <laughs> yeah, this is like the big and tall. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, hey, this is clearly you... the only place in town where anyone could get clothes if they're uh, overweight. Yeah, the only place. Yeah. The one and only. And... Uh, and so they're talking to one of the clerks there and are like, hey, do you know twins that are pretty heavy set?" And the clerk's like, I mean, yeah, but they are never near each other. One's a Democrat, one's a Republican. They haven't talked to each other in 10 years. And Bruce is like, drat. And the clerk is like, but there is a couple of dudes that are cousins, but they look the same mm-hmm. and they're really big. And Bruce is like, oh, <laughs> can you give me their address? And so they, they go scope out of their house. Mm-hmm. And uh, Bruce is like, we'll check in on them in the evening. Uh, so they, they're they like walking by and they're going to show up later. And uh, there's this funny scene at this house where these thugs are carrying one of these dudes around. 
and are struggling and are huffing and puffing between each word that they're saying and mm -hmm. basically complaining about having to lift this big dude around because apparently he's not capable of walking. Uh, they set him down in, uh, uh, in a chair right across from his cousin, his identical cousin, and they're just kind of chatting it up and saying like, hey, uh, I ran into this Batman guy. That really sucked. And the other guy's like, you ran into Batman? I ran into Batman. It was terrible. He's like, man, I I, uh, I hope they don't come here. And the other one's like, oh, I hope they do come here because we got traps and stuff. Yep. Uh, this is also, I don't remember if it was on the previous page. Yeah, previous page. We, we learned their names, but they're using them here. They're Dumfrey and Deaver Tweed. Mm. Last name Tweed, Dumfrey and Deaver. Uh, so not quite Tweedledum and Tweedledee, but, but mm -hmm. close. <laughs> yeah. Like two on the nose. So yeah, we cut to later, uh, Batman and Robin, uh, take the bat plane. It's interesting. Cause in one panel it's a plane. And then in the second, it kind of converts. There's like a helicopter and it's like in stasis above, they get a ladder. They're climbing down, um, to a skylight, which turns out it's a trap. They get caught in a silk net. They're hanging from the ceiling and the goons are like, Hey, we got you. I think this is this is really really bizarre. Uh, Tweedledee and Tweedledum show up. They're dressed as Tweedledee and Tweedledum, um, and the two goons are dressed up as um, the March Hare and the Mad Hatter. Mm -hmm. But the the Mad Hatter for some reason is also a rabbit, <laughs> and they're like, "We're going to um, a, a charity event uh, across town, and that's why we're dressed up. But we're going to cut you down, like before we go." Uh, so they cut them out of the silk, <laughs> the silk netting that they're stuck in and they put them on. I don't know how to describe it. They, they land on a big like floor panel, but it's like, mm -hmm. I don't know, like a 12 by 12. It looks mm -hmm. like glass. And then they shoot this kind of like a ray gun at them mm -hmm. and it just freezes them in place. And they're like, listen, we've got, and I don't know if this is real science. This does not sound no, like real science to me, <laughs> but they're like, because we've got two different frequencies, one frequency that's coming from the floor that you're standing on, the other yeah. frequency that we're shooting with this ma this amazing ray gun, and you are electrically frozen in place. Right. And you're like just going to... Is like freezing their muscles. Yeah. And they're like, and you're going to stay stuck there until you essentially die of starvation. Yeah. I think it's really funny because they're both supposed to be on one foot. Like they're leaned forward with their knees in the air, <laughs> kind of doing the running man. It's like... Yeah. Actually, if your muscles were frozen and you were leaned forward on one foot, wouldn't you just fall? <laughs> Gravity would still apply. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's like they've got the the Michael Jordan or Michael Jackson uh, hooks in their shoes and they're like yeah, leaning yeah, forward. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Exactly like that, yeah. So then the, they all go to the, the masquerade ball, whatever they're going to. Yeah, leave them frozen. Ba and Batman and Robin are just standing there frozen exerting a lot of energy to be just whispered to each other mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and batman whispers back i am trying to conserve my energy so that i can reach my bat belt mm -hmm. and or the utility belt and so he very slowly reaches down grabs his utility belt unbuckles it and this is kind of funny to me because he's all these really slow motions because they're a hard exertion yeah <laughs> but then he manages to throw it across the room yeah and uh short out the the ray gun and then they're free. They're free to go. Yep. It, he's, he's, he's saved his energy. Uh, that's why he's whispering, right? It's a sheer, mm -hmm. sheer force, sheer will. He overcomes, right? Mm -hmm. And we go to the masquerade ball. It's really funny. <laughs> Tweedledum and Tweedledee are on this like dragon float thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like on wheels. It looks like it's made of wood. Mm -hmm. And uh, March Hare is pulling it. Mad Hatter's pushing it, right? They're not walking. <laughs> they're sitting as they do. And it turns out that there's a uh, a costume contest and they're being judged and Tweedledum and Tweedledee win the costume contest. They go up um, to the front and they've won some sort of prize or something. And they're like, I know what our prize is. And Mad Hatter and March Hare whip out guns and they're sticking everybody up. Uh, people are like heading for the exits and other goons show up at the doors to keep them from leaving. I, I love that this is what what you know bad guys do in batman is they they're doing like mass muggings <laughs> that's the thing is they're sticking everyone up simultaneously give us your wallets you yeah. know give us your jewelry you know the the judge is like don't you want your prize and i don't know what does he say you see your honor we picked our prize before we came and doubtless we shall find it more to, to our liking than what's in that package anyway so there's this gigantic 
like cartoonishly large, like wrapped present, like a white box with a red ribbon gift. And they're like, what's in there? Then Sproing <laughs> Batman comes flying out of there, followed by Robin. And they make their, their usual quips. And then they start fighting the Mad Hatter and the March Hare. Yeah, nary a gunshot, by the way. Like all these guys with like Tommy guns and stuff. We don't see a single gunshot. They're just punching mm-hmm. the dudes. One of the goons pulls out a grenade. <laughs> and it's like, get back in your box, man. Um, and Robin kind of comes in with a flying kick to the face. The grenade goes up in the air. Uh, he he. So he threatens with the grenade. He says, I- I've got this grenade. I'm going to throw it into that crowd of people. And Batman yeah, yeah, yeah. is like, oh, you're so crazy that you would be willing to sacrifice all these people to save yourself. Mm-hmm. And the thug is like, uh, yeah, obviously, I'm a thug. <laughs> And so then, uh, yeah, things get heated. He chucks it. Uh, well, I mean, Robin hits him, and the grenade goes flying. And so then Robin has to catch the grenade. Mm-hmm. And he says, like, there's nowhere to throw it, so I'll just throw it way up into the air. And it goes yeah, off thinking, in the air. Thinking fast on his feet. Mm-hmm. And then, I don't know what it is. Something falls and lands on a couple the of the bad guys. The whole thing makes no sense. He says, like, the, the windows are closed. Um, there's people all around. The safest place is straight up. So he throws a grenade straight in the air and then, yeah, like it explodes, but somehow it hits only the goons or like maybe it's no. knocked down a chandelier or something. It knocks down something like a chandelier or a big lamp. It's just a big sphere, like orb. It's really bad. Lands art, on top to of them. It's the storytelling here is mm-hmm. tough. It's really tough. Uh, usually in the comics, this is where they would like explain what it is. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, they would mm-hmm. say like, oh, good thing that chandelier fell. Or mm-hmm. something they didn't but do they that here. They don't do that this time. Yeah, yeah, we don't know what it is. So anyway, that's essentially they they get their guy and uh, they make comments about how the they're too big for the paddy wagon. Yep, they're loading up all the goons, but not Tweedledee and Tweedledum. Mm-hmm. But the cells won't be too uh, too small for them. Yeah, and then uh, it more quips in the end. Yep, Robin says maybe we'll see him again. Mm-hmm. What do you think of the story? Honestly, it's it's fun while also being like really goofy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's got a lot of that golden age flair to it. I don't really have like a big problem with it. Um, sure. I think it's a kind of a fun way to introduce these characters. And they are so boss man that they mm-hmm. don't, they like literally don't do anything at all. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. Their thugs have to carry them around. So they're, they're the brains and they yeah. have people take action. I, I really like that it has kind of the, the Bill Finger angle where they've got to do a thing, right? And the thing mm-hmm. that they're doing, like what's the mystery they're solving? It's that like, oh, there's what appears to be crimes that are impossible for a single person to commit, right? And it's actually twins. That's a cool idea, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't really work because they, they tell us on the cover and on the title page that there's two people, right? So the it's already spoiled before it starts. So that's one downside. Yeah. But I will say, even though it's the similar type of story, I think it's executed with a lot, it's a lot less convoluted than Bill Finger would have done. Bill Finger would have had like, there's a contract, there's a business relationship, there's some sort of embezzlement, there's like three or four characters, we meet the shopkeep, we meet the person that they're trying to get the money from, we meet the, you know, and they've got some sort of interrelationship, like someone's backstabbing someone else. It's sort of this like, you know, business angle, right, that we don't get, right? This is much more straightforward and easier to understand. It's also kind of just like boom, boom, boom. It's Mm -hmm. like there's, you know, they run into Tweedledee, Tweedledee gets away. They see Tweedledum doing a crime. They get away. They show up at the house. They're trapped. And then, you know, they get out of the trap and then they catch them, right? Like, um, very straightforward. So I think, in a way, it's a breath of fresh air after having done so much Bill Finger um, because it is different, right? Um, But at the same time, I can't say that it's necessarily better. (laughs) It's just different. (laughs) Yeah, I... I feel like we should go back in time and start like rating these out of 10 or something. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. But th- I would say that this one is like a little above average, but like not into like good, ca- like the good yeah. category. Yet, I would say you so. Know? But, but I, I did enjoy it. It was fun. And, and I did, like I said earlier, the art was better. Yeah. In, in my opinion. Yeah. No, I think, I think definitely um, once you get past like uh, 1942 ish, 1941, they hit their stride. And I don't know if that's because that's when Bob Kane pieces out. I don't know if that's just like national has more money and they, they're bringing in more people, right? Like, um, I don't know what it is, but they, they kind of, they're, they're seeing greater success. And so they care more about Batman. 
Um, but yeah, I think it really starts to come together in a lot of ways. I think it's like page three of this. It's when you very, the very first time you see Tweedledee. Yeah. Right there. That bottom right. Oh, that's the thumbnail for sure. Yeah. That's a really good, that's, I mean, it like the, the smooth, the flowing lines, they've got shading. It looks like, like those clown dolls or whatever. Yeah. It's kind of grotesque, Mm -hmm. highly detailed. And they're going for kind of creepy. (laughs) Yeah. Definitely creepy. So yeah, anything else before we hop over to some some history, some backstory, some inspiration? No, I want to hear the history. So yeah, Tweedledee and Tweedledum, not actually all that important, much like Mad Hatter, only appears two more times in the Golden Age. And um, they remain relatively unimportant. Like I, I was trying to look up like an exhaustive list of appearances like beyond the Golden Age. And like I could find like a couple dozen, like not even, like less no than way. 20. Yeah. What people might know them from is like the video games. So they show up in the Arkham games um, and TV shows. From what I understand, they had a pretty important episode in Gotham, which I haven't watched. So they are definitely part of the mythos, even as they are not sort of, you know, top 10, top 20, you know, mm. villains or whatever. Yeah. What do you what do you know about Alice in Wonderland? You you said you watched the cartoon, but that's about it. Uh, Yeah. I mean, I know a little bit of background that um, was it Lewis Carroll um, mm-hmm. probably did a lot of drugs. <laughs> and uh, and was inspired to write this story. Um, we'll talk the, a little bit about him. Yeah, there's, I know there's like some psychology there, and it's so the Alice in Wonderland story is basically like a series of like almost like short stories where you just like interact with different characters. There's mm. the I don't remember is it like something that gets gets eaten by crocodiles and um, yeah, I just remember it was like. There was never like the correct age to watch it. It was like you're sure. too young and you'd be too scared, or you're yeah. old enough that you were like, "This is dumb." <laughs> yeah, I, I had like an old girlfriend who loved Alice in Wonderland, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, which was cool. But I think I've only seen the movie like twice or something like that. Sure, sure, so sure. I don't know a lot. Uh, I was just at Disneyland and wanted to ride the Alice in Wonderland. Uh, ride, right, mm-hmm. but I previewed it on YouTube, and it mm-hmm. looked too scary. It took, excuse me, it looked too scary for my son, so we did not ride it. Um, uh-huh. So that's kind of the extent of it. <laughs> it's, that it's not a lot. Yeah, I've never been on the ride. Um, I want to try that someday, but so I wasn't able to read the whole book, um, either Alice in Wonderland or Through the Looking Glass. That's actually something that's interesting to note is that Matt Hatter is from Alice in Wonderland. Tweedledee and Tweedledum are from Through the Looking Glass, which is actually the sequel. But I did read hunks of it, mm-hmm. and it was an annotated copy. So I was like doing some reading on backstory, That's cool. which was really, really, yeah. If you're familiar with the the movie, sounds like you are, then you're pretty well familiar with the events of the book. Um, you're right; it's like it almost feels like different sort of skits or scenes. They're not mm-hmm. there's not really a through line through them, but it yeah. it is told as a continuous narrative. So it does go beginning to end. She's going from place to place, meeting these different people, right? Um, it's same in the book. It's 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 fairly faithful to the beats of the story, but I, I I do think it's worth knowing that the tone felt fairly different to me. The story is always very bizarre. It has fantastic occurrences in in the original and in adaptations, but the book has a way of making it feel sort of inherently silly, right? Like it's almost the difference between like American and British humor, right? Like in America, oh, really? it's like that's okay. so random, and British, mm. it's like a little understated. So yeah. the the difference between surreal and and psychedelic, right? So for example. In the movie, there's a scene that goes on for an extended period of time, like 30 seconds to a minute, where the Mad Hatter is actively putting like butter and sugar and jam inside a pocket watch to try to fix it, right? And they're like pouring tea on top, right? And it's very ridiculous. They're being animated, bombastic. Yeah. This is so crazy. Look at us, right? Looney Tunes, right? <laughs> yes. They're making a gigantic mess. In the book, They, it's a matter of fact. It's like retrospective. They're having a conversation. They're kind of miffed like, oh, you know, why didn't we, How? you know, maybe I didn't use enough butter when I was trying to fix the watch. You know, it's it's a kind of understood like, ah, it's like yeah. they're, they're hanging a hat on the fact that it is ridiculous, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah, th- they both have the Mad Hatter being sort of irrational, erratic, but like one is like observably mad and the other is like performatively mad, right? Mm. You're supposed to think that person's weird when you're reading the book. In the movie, you're like watching him b- be ridiculous. So mm. um, very British humor. Yeah, that's that's my window into the book. Cool. It is written under the pen name Lewis Carroll. So as you said, Lewis Carroll, but that's not the person's real name. His real name was uh, Charles Lutwidge Dodgson. Hmm. Um, I'll continue to refer to him as Carol, uh, cause sure. it's easier. Yeah. He lived from 1832 to 1898 
And professionally, he was a don at Christchurch College. Um, if you're not familiar with the concept of a don, it's a professor. Um, mm-hmm. To be at Christchurch, you had to be a clergy as well, right? So you're both okay. a teacher and you're a, a don, I, I assume, is like a, a priesthood. You know, How's that uh, spelled? D-O-N. D-O-N. I'm thinking of yeah. like Don Corleone, like then the, the <laughs> mafia, you know, that might be, they might there share might an etymology. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, his, his deal was math. So he taught and researched math. His work was in geometry, linear and matrix algebra. And while his work was well regarded at the time, it's not really viewed as significant now. So like when you are a doctor, if you've ever gotten a PhD or whatever, like the whole deal, the idea is that somehow you, you're supposedly, you have expanded you know, humanity's knowledge on something, right? Mm -hmm. You're supposed to have done something original or new in terms of like research or thought. That's like, that's the whole point of a thesis, right? And so retrospectively, when you think about, you know, doctorates in the past, it's often like people are sort of saying, did they really do it? Or like, are they still relevant today? A lot of times when you have people that do math or science or whatever, they'll they'll have, you know, ideas that are considered interesting at the time, but are now like disproven theories or whatever, right? right? Like, so we don't reference back to it because it turns out like, you know, physics doesn't work that way or whatever. Right, right, right. right. Um, or, he's yeah, kind we, of been we learned way. more and it, it doesn't apply. I think there's a lot of uh, interesting thesis from uh, uh, older times that don't mm. apply anymore because like uh, society has changed. Mm-hmm. Like you can imagine that someone being the foremost expert on like uh, shooing horses <laughs> sure. <laughs> Not that big of a deal anymore, you know. Totally. Uh, because yeah. technology has changed. But but yeah, you're right. The idea is that and it is probably really challenging as as the days go on to mm-hmm. come up with a uh, a thesis uh concept that has never been done before. Um, right, right, so right. they kind of get longer and longer and more specific uh in, sure. in their titles and stuff. So in his personal life, he's mm-hmm. a pretty odd guy and is now you don't say. Yeah, he, he's now very controversial, I should say. Oh, um, mm-hmm. He he was never married, which is somewhat normal for, for Don's, although not required. Um, and by most accounts, never had any normal romantic relationships at all. Instead, what he's most known for is making friendships with children, mm. um, in particular girls. Those he met through uh, professional means or other adult relationships, as well as just like those in public. So it's not unusual for him to like strike up conversations and make friends with with children he would frequently entertain them um both with adults present and alone this wasn't considered as problematic or scandalous at the time uh than it is now victorian england sex and gender dynamics are kind of messed up (laughs) in a lot of ways Um, but infants and young children were treated as mostly genderless right or sexless Mm, right so you didn't have um things like we do today where like a baby you would have in gendered clothes or gender colors or haircuts right Mm -hmm, mm mm-hmm And then once you reach like sort of later childhood, uh, pre-adolescence, right, you know, age of consent for a big hunk of Carol's life uh, wasn't in law, like wasn't a thing. (laughs) And then later, you know, when it was, it was 12, right? He would have seen a law pass in his lifetime that moved the age of consent up to 13, but this would have been like after he was writing these books and eventually 16. In fact, it would often be considered more scandalous um, to be with an adult, like an adult male to be privately with an adult woman. Because the inference being that the opposite gender is spending time alone together is inherently sexual, mm-hmm. where, whereas a, a being with a child is inherently unsexual or asexual. Right. I, I have seen this uh, explained. It's kind of interestingly where, where you could look at like baby photos and yeah. they wear all the same stuff uh, regardless yep. of their, their sex or gender. And today that's kind of odd and confusing. But at, at the time, if they looked at our photos, they'd be like, wow, what is wrong with you guys? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because the moment that you... Um, give them gendered clothes you are like sexualizing that child and that is um uh beyond the pale right so totally uh they so yeah that it's it's an interesting perspective to take uh, at the time and it is is founded around like a lot of innocence and uh yeah so back to what you were saying no that that, that's that's exactly right um and 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 what i was saying about adults right like it, it was considered potentially immoral for you to have a friendship across genders as an adult, right? Because that that is, you know, inherently sexual, right? Mm-hmm. And because of this, there are historians that view Carol positively, right? They don't necessarily think that he did anything wrong. But I, I have to let you know that one of Carol's pastimes was photography, which was relatively new and expensive. And one of the things that that he loved to photograph was, was little girls, including several 
um, that we know of that we have that um, were suggestive and included nudity. Yeah. So kind of a messed Ooh. up guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not, not a great person. No. I bring all this up. <clears throat> it is relevant, I promise. Not just because he wrote children's fiction, but because Alice was inspired by a real person, a real girl. Her name was Alice Liddell. And Alice was the daughter of the dean of Christchurch. So this is kind of like his boss, right? Uh, Henry Liddell. I don't know if it's Little or Liddell. Mm -hmm. Um, His relationship with Henry and Henry's children was especially close. The legend goes for this story that Henry and his three daughters, um, Henry, his three daughters and Lewis were on a boat ride down a river together. They would do this with somewhat frequency. And uh, on one hot, sunny summer day, they pulled off to the side and hung out under the shade of a tree. And Carol starts going off the dome. He's making up a story as he goes about a story of Alice, you know, having an adventure underground. And as the legend goes, Alice implores him to write it down and give it to her directly so she can relive the story, Hmm. which he does. He creates a manuscript um, that's about half as long as the final book and gives it to her directly before going on deciding that he should turn it into a book and get it published. There's tons and tons of speculation about the nature of his relationship with Alice specifically, but given the amount of time we have, uh, I don't have anything, you know, I can't, I can't really go into depth with it, but su- sure. suffice to say it's, it's controversial. Um, yeah. So that's the original Alice. That's Lewis Carroll, mathematician, eccentric guy. It's, it kind of sucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry for taking you to that awful place. Is there anything you want to know about that before we go on to Tweedledee and Tweedledum specifically? Did you learn anything about why why the story bounces around so much? Like, what what was the like? Did uh, so did Lewis Carroll? They wrote two books and only two books, or more? So I'm super not an expert on any of this. <laughs> You're kind of catching me off guard. I do know that he um, Lewis Carroll, the pen name, was used for all of his works, and it was because he wanted to avoid, I guess, like notoriety or like people knowing because he he did have a job, right? Like as a professor, people could go find him. Um, and so he kind of wanted to be under the radar in terms of connection to his works. And I do know he did some other things, like there are famous poems, including one about the Jabberwock. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I think there's some other books, but I really super not an expert on any of that. So yeah, kind of kind of an active author at that time. And from what I understand, that's pretty normal for the the Dons um, to kind of have side hustles, like and and become famous as authors and and um, thinkers of their time. Um, yeah. Cool. My my sister described him to me as um as as like one of those people that goes goes crazy uh you know because they they looked at numbers for too long like the mathematicians that what was the what was the Jim Carrey movie uh the number twenty three yeah <laughs> basically goes crazy because math um I don't know how true that is but it's I mean it's reasonable I'm yeah. I actually while you were chatting I yeah. um pulled up their Wikipedia and l- yeah. looks like Lewis Carroll has like almost as many mathematical works as they have literary works that makes sense yeah so there's like a meh, dozen-ish of each okay yeah I, I hope i do a dozen things before i die that people remember <laughs> <laughs> can you imagine writing a dozen books my goodness no I, I i mean i mean now that we have ai i'm way more way more <laughs> <laughs> so uh do you know anything about tweedledum and tweedledee specifically uh they look the same Mm-hmm. They, the, there's some sort of literary thing where like one finishes the other sentences or they like uh-huh. bounce back and forth or something. They work for somebody. I think they, do they work for like remember. the yeah. queen of hearts or something? I really don't, Maybe. I don't recall. There's, they're amongst the, the, there's like rogues. Rogues gallery. Rogues gallery. Yeah. So they are <laughs> among the, like the, the primary like rogues gallery of the Alice in Wonderland story. There's, sure. there's like the Queen of Hearts. They've got the Cheshire Cat. Uh-huh. There's uh, Tweedledee and Tweedledum. Uh, and then there's... There's the Caterpillar that smokes the hookah. Mm-hmm, there's the Caterpillar and the the White Hare. Mm-hmm. March and hair, yeah. yeah, the March... No, not the March Hare. The, the, oh, the White, white Rabbit. rabbit. Yes, the yes, White yes, Rabbit yes, yes, that, that's, that's late. And then, yeah, the Mad Hatter and March Hare. Those yes. are the ones I'm thinking of, at least. But those are, those are the biggies. And Tweedledee and Tweedledum are as i would say as famous as any of those others are definitely so um like i was saying before they didn't come from alice in wonderland the first book they came from looking at ga- uh, through the looking glass which is the second one mm-hmm. and carol being a professor of math there's often a deeper meaning to the content in the book right so like mm. it's the case that 
there are many things that are references. So these characters or the things they say, the things that they do, they can be sort of jokes, right? Like when Alice feels like she's falling forever and she speculates about how she's going to come out the other side, right? Uh, of the earth, right? What's right. the distance to the core? Like What's Mario. the distance to like China or whatever? Yeah. Yeah. It's like kind of a physics joke almost, right? Like he he's kind of musing not just in a random way, but sort of an intelligent way. And yeah, there's that type of thing throughout the whole book. And and the Mad Hatter is the example we went on last episode is one that people often know, which is like people who worked on hats, they worked with felt, there was mercury, they mercury, would get mercury yeah. poisoning, they go crazy, mm-hmm. right? Tweedledee and Tweedledum is another case of this. They um, are what you call an, an inanomorph. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. In an, an anomorph, <laughs> which cool. is basically just a, a mathematical or geometric co- concept of mirror opposites, right? Oh, it's so, like symmetry. Exactly. And... Tweedledee is always saying contrawise, like it's one of his favorite words, um, which also means opposite. And, you know, I have some diagrams here in the doc of like it, different inanigomorphs. You can see just like, a, a you know, a, a shape folded on either half. We use it now in the context of, of chemistry. You have like different um, combinations of molecules sure. that are the same, but they're flipped and they make different things, right? Yeah. Those would be inanigomorphs. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Um, th- actually, there's really famous story where mm. um the uh the children of thalidomide mm. do you know the the story of thalidomide I've not heard of that no uh so it was a uh drug that was used uh, it was a medication that was used for something i don't remember and it was taken by a lot of people especially women i think and <laughs> uh clinically safe everything was good to go and then uh, through the manufacturing process, they uh, essentially made a lower grade, cheaper version of it. Um, and mm. that caused a lot of birth defects, mm. um, children born without arms or legs, so, yeah. stuff like that. And uh, essentially, my understanding is that there's this concept of right-handed versus like left-handed um, mm-hmm. chemistry, where you can say this, this is how these elements bond to each other. And it makes like a tree or whatever. And if they were all right-handed, then like your thalidomide is good to go. But if you mix with some that are left-handed, which mm. is which is the symmetrical version, those are like poisonous. And gotcha. That uh, the mixture uh, in that cheaper version is what caused all these problems. Fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. You have like the same molecules connected in the same way, but they're like flipped. Yeah. I had no difference. idea that was a thing. Like, yeah. I'll, I'll put I'll edit in the diagram into the video. But like you have th- these two pictures of of tartic acid or t- tartaric acid, and like they're the same, but they're mirror images of each other. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one is D tartaric, and one is L tartaric. I didn't know this was a thing. Yeah, fascinating. Uh, I think another way to think about it, uh, d- to visualize it a little bit, is like you've got a spiral that goes clockwise up, and you've got another one that goes counterclockwise up, and mm-hmm. they're the the same width, the same height. The spiral is the same step or whatever, but yes. they're they're mirrored. Um, that's, that's another diagram that you have in here of, of showing that kind of, what's that word? Uh, in, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but there's, there's many people that, who agree that, that, that this is like, uh, Carol sort of playing with a, a geometric mathematical, you know, idea I mean, that makes that been total sense. Yeah. Total sense. Tweedledee and Tweedledum in the book deal mostly in poems. Um, and it's no coincidence we're not totally sure where the name combination of Tweedledee and Tweedledum originates. It's not in Alice in Wonderland. Um, Lewis Carroll doesn't come up with it. Uh, we know it's present in poetry that's uh, at least 100 years before Alice in Wonderland. There is a, a famous poet named John Byram um, who wrote a poem in 1725 about um, Handel and uh, Bono, Bonosini. I don't know. And, uh, two of these classical music composers who would have been active 100 years before him in the 17th century, 1600s, right? Uh, and he wrote this famous poem about them. Some say, compared to Bonosini, the mynere handles but a ninny. Others aver that he to handle is scarcely fit to hold a candle. Strange all this difference should be twixt Tweedledum and Tweedledee. So it's kind of a poem about how these guys have have beef with each other, these two composers. He's, uh, uh, it's Bononcini because he's Italian. Bononcini. Bononcini. There you go. There you go. Yeah. And th- that's the first example we have of a written Tweedledum and Tweedledee, just a, a name kind of making fun of these guys that's and funny. the fact that they had beef, calling each other ninnies. Be- beef is in like, 
frustration with each other, not like Arby's, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> then they're introduced in the book with another poem. Tweedledum and Tweedledee agreed to have a battle, for Tweedledum and Tweedledee had spoiled his nice new rattle. Just then flew down a monstrous crow, as black as tar barrel, which frightened both the heroes so they quite forgot their quarrel. Hmm. And they deliver a super long poem in the book. If, if you've seen the Disney movie, are you familiar with the musical number about the walrus and the carpenter? Uh, somewhat. Super psychedelic. Like, it, we cut to a totally different thing. Alice isn't there, right? The idea is that Tweedledum and Tweedledee are telling a story. Oh, it's the clams, right? The walrus eats all the yes. clams. Oh, it's, <laughs> yes. it's freaky. It's yeah. super weird. Yeah. yeah. These two guys, they agree that they're going to fish up the clams together. They go and they cook them. And then one tricks the other that he's going to eat them alone. Right. Super trippy. But in the animated version, all the clams are like happy clams mm-hmm. that just get eaten. Yes. It's scary. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's kind of weird that we, it's, it's children's stuff. Yeah. Disney did some really intense stuff at that time. Like, you, they did. Like Pinocchio and how like the, the kids turn into donkeys and stuff. Like, yes. Freaky. <laughs> yeah. It is yeah. weird. We've watched both of those with Clark recently, by the way. Both oh. Alice in Wonderland and Pinocchio. How did he handle them? He took it in stride. He was more afraid at like, he was really afraid in Beauty and the Beast, of the Beast. He was afraid of the cave in Aladdin. I believe, yeah, totally. But yeah, I, th- I think it's too psychedelic. He doesn't really yeah. understand what's going on. Yeah. So it doesn't bother him as much, but. Yeah. So before. In Anteomorphs, I was talking about how there's deep, deeper meaning by, behind many of the things, right? Mm-hmm. There's this, I, I picked up an annotated version of Alice in Wonderland, right? Like there's footnotes every few paragraphs about all of these references or all of these things that could have inspired and all these other people writing about his work. I should point out that there are many writers and scholars over the years that hate the fact that people feel the need to dig in. <laughs> There's um, a conservative uh, a reformer at the time called G.K. Chesterton. I've actually talked with you about him before. We talked okay. to him, about, but he got cut from the episode. Um, he's an interesting guy for various reasons. Uh, he's on the record, like being very adamant that you should let this book be silly and whimsical. It's for kids. Like, why are you trying to figure it out? Like, stop. This is you're ruining the point of the book. And a supporting argument for for this is the the Walrus and the Carpenter. This poem that has this sort of trippy story. Yeah. Um because it's a nonsense rhyme, right? When Carol provided the manuscript to Tenniel, Sir John Tenniel, the the uh, artist for the book, he offered any of the above. It could have been a carpenter, a butterfly, or a baronet because they all had three syllables and they all fit the rhyme scheme. And he let the artist decide which one it was going to be. <laughs> and T- Tenniel is the one that chose that it was going to be carpenter. Oh, so, that's fun. You know, he he even wasn't really passionate about the angle or the deeper meaning of this book. It is, you know, meant to be nonsense in a lot of cases. So, uh, you know, even as we spent like 10 minutes talking about an annual immerse and like the deeper meaning behind these things. Yeah, th- there is there is a camp that says like, don't think about it too hard. That's really it's interesting. A, it's a silly kids book. It reminds me of um, Jackson Pollock, who yeah. was a uh, artist uh, famous for the splotches. I don't, I don't know how to describe it. Splatters, yeah. splotches, stuff like that. And uh, just did what he, he thought looked really good. And th- he had these like artist friends who would be like, oh, it's it's expressing like women's suffrage or it's expressing the 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 challenge of, of capitalism on on the lower class. And he would be like, no, it's just pretty. Why can't it just be pretty? <laughs> it's just art, you know? Yeah. It doesn't have to have a meaning. And I really like that that notion. Yeah. Well, it's it's interesting the the artists or authors who like take different stances on those sorts of things. Like mm-hmm. who is it? Tolkien is like always on the record, like, my books are not about the world wars. They're not about the world wars. He says it over and over and over again. Do not read too much into this, even though it's pretty obvious that mm-hmm. there's a pretty, 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 pretty He came up with it in yeah. his head. During a world war. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it's, it's hard to avoid. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas, like, George Lucas is like, Star Wars is about the Viet Cong. Like, he's, like, very <laughs> adamant. Yeah. You should know that, like, th- this is direct reference to, like, American politics. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, you know what? I don't know if Carol was asked about these sorts of things at the time, but I know that there's a lot of ink spilled about it retrospectively. So. Makes sense. I mean, and anything big like that, especially if it's, like, a psychedelic nature, people are trying to figure out what it's about. Oh, totally. Yeah. yeah. So that's Alice in Wonderland. That's Tweedledee. That's Tweedledum. That's Mad Hatter. Mm-hmm. We keep we keep getting pulled back into the Victorian stuff, man. Like I uh, <laughs> have have tried to like take an active stance to like make the show not hour long deep dives on like 
<laughs> crosswise history, like tangentially related. We've been mm-hmm. bringing in guests. We've been trying to make it more focused on on the Batman characters and villains, and it keeps sucking us back in, man. Like there's there's just too much literature that it, this is connected to. It's I, fascinating. I, yeah, it is fascinating. I don't find it particularly problematic. Oh no, you, you hit on something. I think it might have been our last I- episode. Um, yeah. that has really stuck with me is is you were saying um, for us the issue we're talking about was like eighty years ago. Yeah, eighty years before that was Lewis Carroll, Alice in right? Wonderland. Alice in Wonderland. Yeah, and yeah. so um, we're talking about our favorite things, the 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 literature that we we're being raised on in a way. Yeah, and they all the stuff that they were building enough of was the literature mm-hmm. that they were raised on, like yeah. eighty years prior. So yeah, no Dracula, mm-hmm. no Batman. Yeah, you know, so it's like no Spring Hill Jack, probably no Batman. It's it's like that George Lucas, like it's it has poetry, you know, like it does. It rhymes. It rhymes. <laughs> so yeah, they 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 do hang out for a while. In in some of the modern con- comics, you have what they call the Wonderland Gang, and you'll have these characters teaming up for various reasons. You know, you get really weird uh, groupings where like the Joker is the sort of the ringleader, and the the Mad Hatter, and you know Tweedledee and Tweedledum, and like Harley Quinn are all working together. Um, sort of being a, you know, a, a league of evil or whatever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, but they stick around. They become, for whatever reason, part of part of the um, the lore. Yeah. I, it's it's also kind of interesting because these are the, like, that exact type of, of character. Um, I was, I was either texting or on the phone with my sister recently, and I yeah. told her about this thing that someone had pointed out about Batman that had, like, changed the way that I, like, looked at and how much I loved the Batman universe over others. And mm-hmm. uh, basically the, the, the long and the short of it is that in Gotham, they have a prison, right? Yeah. Uh, Black, Black Blackgate, Gate. Blackgate prison. Mm-hmm. Um, but like most of the, the super villains, they don't go to Blackgate. They go yeah. to the asylum. They go to Arkham they do. Asylum. And it's yeah. because the villains in Batman are, a lot more psychotic essentially right, in, right. in the same way that like Batman is and is mm-hmm. a, is a much more like psychedelic and, and psychological um, universe for mm-hmm. a superhero to live in, which is not mirrored very well anywhere mm-hmm. else. The, usually the supervillains are just like people that want power, people that want money, mm-hmm. not people that are driven by mental illness and chaos. Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. um, and so that I think that's part of the darkness of uh, the the Batman universe that is really interesting and appealing. And so that grouping you just described are all of those types of people. You've got mm-hmm. Joker, Harley, a Mad Hatter, Tweedledee, Tweedledum. There's a host of others um, like mm-hmm. Scarecrow or sure. Zaz or whatever that are just like they're they're not really trying to get rich or trying to get mm-hmm. power. They're just trying to cause trouble. Yeah, it's interesting to me that like from the beginning, it's not. Um, it, we we kind of said this in the, in the last time that like uh, in the Mad Hatter book, it felt like they picked up the character and they put it in there, like it is the Mad Hatter. Mm-hmm. It's interesting in this story, that's not the case, right? It's two guys that you know are the Tweed cousins or whatever, and they they're choosing to dress up like Tweedledee and Tweedledum. They're like, yeah. oh, we have this um, kind of you know random, uncanny, you know resemblance to the, these children children's characters let's lean into it let's be ridiculous let's be over the top let's be crazy right like th- there's something that's a little unsettling about the idea that someone's going to choose to make themselves that way right right it's a it's a different angle right it, then mm-hmm. then the sort of like you know bill finger random goon you know that, <laughs> that we get a lot yeah. in, in the early batman stuff so yeah I think I think it's it is it is part and parcel with the success of Batman is the rogues gallery for sure. Yeah. Even even when we're talking about these less successful characters, right? The, the, these are people that you know stick around, but they're a part of the greater pantheon. It's that's part of the reason, right? Like it's not just people showing up for Joker or just showing up for for Two Face. It's knowing that like there's going to be another eccentric, wild, you know, different take of this sort of like. So so hyper realistic, it it wraps around to ridiculous, you know, uh, caricature that that keeps people coming back issue after issue for eighty years. Coming yeah. up on eighty five. Yeah, how big is Batman? We should, we, uh, <laughs> we have an episode about that. <laughs> we do episode number one. Hey, Bat family. Help us out and drop a like on the video and tell us what we got wrong in the comments. If you want your voicemail or letter on the show, you can send it to us on our website, batlessons.com. And to keep the Batman history train going, watch this video next.